Okay, well, hello YouTube. Thank you for your questions. I'm going to try to get through all of them. Uh, if I've missed anybody, I do apologise. Um, but we have uh, quite a lot of questions here, so let's get right to it. Okay, we start with a question from a person whose name I can't pronounce. Indeed, the name is written in a script that I don't think I've ever seen before, so um, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how to say the name. But let's uh, go with the question. Uh, if I conceive God solely as the metaphysical foundation of reality, without attributing any attribute, unlike traditional theism, being a purely abstract concept, would that denote a theism? Or only if there is a feeling of religious devotion? Yeah, so, I mean, I wouldn't consider this to be theism. Um, there is obviously nothing wrong with using the term God to refer to the metaphysical foundation of reality, whatever it may be. I mean, like, it, that's just a definition. You can just stipulate that you're using the word that way. Um, so it's not like incorrect, but I mean, I don't really see what the motivation would be for for doing that. I mean, it seems like it's liable to be very misleading. It's liable to, to cause uh, quite a lot of misunderstandings if you choose to use the word God in that kind of way. Um, I, I, I mean, in, in fact, I would say, you know, even if there is a feeling of religious devotion, I, I'm not sure what what a feeling of religious devotion is supposed to amount to if we're just talking about the metaphysical foundation of reality where what that is is just left completely unspecified i mean so if we take you know the traditional conception of god as this omnipotent om omniscient benevolent being that created us and that maybe has a plan for us or something like that well okay i can see why people might have this feeling of devotion towards it people might have a, like desire to worship it because it's you know it has so god on the traditional conception has a mind god has some sort of plan for us and so it makes sense that somebody might you know think about that sort of entity and say you know i'm i'm going to like serve this entity and i'm going to devote myself to this entity like that that is understandable to me whereas now if you if you're just talking about the metaphysical foundation of reality i, I, I mean like okay, but what 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 it, what even is? I mean, what even is that? That's just you know, that's just the underlying stuff. I mean, to me, you know, talking about having devotion to that is like saying that you have devotion to, you know, salt or chairs or something. I mean, it's, that's very strange. I'm not really sure what that would even involve. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, so uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, using the term God in that kind of way would not, um, that would not count as theism. Um, that would just count as a, a very strange way of using the term God. Um, you also ask, if I take the concept of Brahman, who has no attributes, it's not a personal God, it does not have omni attributes, etc., as God, disregarding the whole collection of beings after him in Hinduism, and I do not have a religious feeling, would I still be a theist? Um, I, I, I mean, I don't really know anything about Hinduism or uh, Brahman, but if Brahman has no attributes, then again, it seems a bit strange to call that God. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, like if we... Okay, so there's the thing that just has n no properties, uh, no attributes. Um, okay, well, you know, what is that? Why would you have any sense of devotion to that? Um, oh, and you say, I do not have a devout feeling, but... I, I mean, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, it just seems like, why are we using the term God for this? It it, uh, it just seems like, um, it, it seems very misleading. Um, okay, AC, are you based or cringe? Um, I don't care one way or the other. I have no opinion on that. Um, I know that you've touched on suicide in past AMAs, but I wanted to get your thoughts on suicide prevention programs. Do you think that suicide should be prevented at all costs? Or are there certain situations or contexts where suicide is permissible and under what conditions? Um, I, my view is, um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of just completely libertarian about this. I don't think there's anything, I don't think anybody owes anybody else their existence. Um, I don't take it that continued existence is preferable or like should be preferred by everybody by everybody, you know, I mean, like, as far as it happens, I want to continue existing, I, I thoroughly enjoy existing, I, um, well, maybe I don't thoroughly enjoy it, that might be a bit strong, but I certainly want to continue existing, I have a bunch of projects that I would like to, um, 
get uh, that I would like to pursue. And so, you know, I want to continue existing. But um, I mean, other people assess things differently. And that that seems fine to me. I mean, I'm fine with people valuing things differently. And if you're just talking about, you know, your own life, your own body, I think it's up to you what you do with that. So, um, um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't really have any sort of moral issue with suicide. Um, Alex Parks, a question about note taking. Do you always take them? Do you write them on a notebook, use sticky notes, type them out and save them on a document? Do you underline or highlight? Well, uh, I mean, I don't always take them. Um, probably maybe 50% of the things I read, I take notes on and I take notes on my computer. I usually use a uh, notepad or a word document or something like that. Um, and then very often, um, the videos that I make are the product of me taking notes. So like I will read something, take notes about it. And then if the notes uh, interest me enough, then they might end up being developed into a video. So um, I sort of I, when I'm learning philosophy, I use a combination of note taking and writing scripts for these YouTube videos. Um, that's actually part of my method of learning. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I do take notes. Yes, of course, but not always. I mean, actually, yeah, I mean, a lot of what you read uh, is you do a lot of reading where you're sort of trying to find the interesting material, because there's a lot of stuff that's just not really relevant to whatever you're concerned about, whatever problem you're concerned about. So, you know, when you read an article, you're you're sometimes sort of reading the article to see whether or not it's even relevant to your concerns. Um, and then when you find an article that is relevant, well, then you take notes about it. Um, as for underlining or highlighting, nope, never did that. Uh, well, actually, I say I never did it. I did once, I was forced to do it um, because I, for one of my courses, we were doing, uh, it was a reading of Plato, actually, it's Plato's Republic, and the, um, you know, we, we would all have the sort of book with us when we were doing the course, and the lecturer insisted that we highlight, um, and so I was forced to highlight for that, but I, I don't get anything from highlighting. I, I actually would kind of just highlight randomly, it didn't, you know, just so I could, just so I was showing that I was following the instructions. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know why it's, I mean, obviously a lot of people apparently find that to be a useful tool, but it, it didn't really work for me. Um, okay, aim, what doth life? I don't know what that question, what does life? I don't know what that question means. <laughs> um, Animor, hi Kane, I, notice, I know you've described yourself before as an empiricist. Would that mean you reject the notion of innate ideas? How would you categorize logical intuitions and where would you say we get them if so? Um, well, uh, I'm not sure if I'm really an empiricist. I mean, I'd, no, I'm probably, I still am an empiricist. Um, but okay, let me sort of put on the, um, the, the definitely an empiricist hat um, and answer this question from that point of view. So um, the kind of empiricism that I endorsed is something known as stance empiricism. Um, and the idea of stance empiricism is that empiricism consists in more a sort of set of like values and commitments and projects rather than in belief in a particular proposition. So traditionally, um, when we define what empiricism is, one of the traditional definitions is that empiricism consists in the rejection of innate ideas. Um, now, the problem with this kind of definition is that it turns empiricism into a psychological hypothesis that has probably been refuted, or it may be not exactly refuted, but um, so the, the claim, when, when we start talking about innate ideas, um, I mean, first of all, there are a whole bunch of problems with uh, any attempt to distinguish innate from acquired characteristics, right? Like, so even figuring out what it means to say that something is innate, is a big problem. That's like a major topic in philosophy of biology, and there's really not a lot of consensus on that. Um, but then, however, however it is you choose to define innateness, there's probably going to be some sense in which we actually do have innate ideas, um, or at least you know there's something, there's some other you know structure or something, or some part of uh, you know the the human cognitive development that plays the same sort of role that innate ideas would play. 
Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't really find that to be a particularly useful way of conceiving of what empiricism is. Um, the way that I see empiricism is that empiricism involves a kind of resistance to explanation by postulation. Um, so the way that a lot of philosophy has traditionally proceeded um, is that you you take some, you know, I don't know, some sort of discourse or practice, um, you know, where, you know, maybe it's our practice of making moral judgments, maybe it's the practice of mathematics, of logic, of science, whatever. Um, and then philosophers uh, would very often try to account for the success of these practices by postulating uh, entities um, or processes beyond what manifests in experience, um, of which these practices provide true descriptions. So in the case of morality, for instance, um, we postulate moral properties of which uh, moral statements provide true descriptions. And then this is supposed to explain something about these practices. Um, so similarly with, with, you know, mathematics, right? Well, why is math? So we have this puzzle about mathematics. Like we, we notice mathematics is incredibly successful. Um, and uh, we want to know why is it successful? And then maybe in order to account for that success, you say, well, because it's, it's giving us these true descriptions of, you know, I don't know, platonic objects or uh, abstract structures or something. But um, we're postulating entities of which this practice provides true descriptions. And it's that kind of explanation by postulation that um, the the sort of empiricist tradition is rebelling against. At least that's how I see empiricism. Um, my view on empiricism here comes from Bas van Frassen. It's certainly not unique to me. It comes from him. So van Frassen's stance empiricism was the sense in which I was an empiricist. And I, I guess I probably still am an empiricist, yeah. Um, as for uh, this point about logical intuitions, uh, well... Uh, I'm, 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 I'm not sure what logical intuitions really are here. I mean, so you ask, how would I categorize logical intuitions? Um, I mean, the, the first thing I'm inclined to say to that is, well, w what exactly are logical intuitions? Um, and in what context am I categorizing them? <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, it's like, um, so I guess is that like, uh, would that be an intuition along the lines of, uh, say, the intuition that um, it's impossible for a statement to be both true and false at the same time. I mean, is that a, a logical intuition? Or maybe the intuition that any argument with a modus ponens form is truth-preserving? Uh, is that a logical intuition? Um, I'm not... I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just not... I'm not sure. I, okay, so maybe I, I should just say, like, briefly, my take on logic is... So I see logic as being something that provides a bunch of formal models um, and these formal models or formal systems we can use them as models of arguments so um, you know there's there's sort of there's natural language and there's the inferences that people make when you know when they're talking or writing or whatever um, you know, so we just, we talk, we, we have ideas, we try to criticise and assess these ideas and, you know, we produce these things called arguments when we're doing this. Um, and there's this sort of just, I guess you could call it like natural rationality. There's just the, um, the kind of everyday sort of way in which people make inferences. And then I see logic as giving us... Uh, uh, systems which we can use to create formal models of these arguments. But I don't take it that that there's like one true logic or, you know, one right way of formalizing an argument. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know whether that answers the question, but that's kind of the view. I mean, I'm basically a sort of instrumentalist about logic. Um, so, you know, that's my view there. Um, <clears throat> okay, An Anthony Allen. What is your opinion on fitting attitude theories found often found in moral and aesthetic philosophy? You know, I'm actually not really that familiar with these approaches. I, uh, I, I mean, it's it's always frustrating when you sort of confront, like you take it that you have some sort of knowledge or expertise of an area, um, like for instance, meta ethics. I've read a lot of meta ethics. I know quite a bit about meta ethics, or at least I thought I did. But then you know you confront this entire 
tradition that you're actually not really that uh, familiar with. It's, <laughs> it's always annoying when that happens, and that's happened here. I don't really know much about fitting attitude theories. Um, I mean, I, I, I've encountered them, bits and pieces of them, right? And so I can give a very general uh, answer on my sort of attitude. I think that, um, I mean, I, I think that it's not going to work, from my point of view, it's not going to work as an alternative to a more sort of just hardcore subjectivist or anti-realist account of value. Um, because fittingness is something that only makes sense when it's understood sort of sub subjectively. So, okay, so the fitting, the idea of a fitting attitude theory, as I understand it, and my understanding is very limited, but on the fitting attitude theory, as I understand it, when we say X is valuable, that means something like, it is fitting to favour X, something like that. But then, okay, so when we say it is fitting to favour X, what does that mean? Um, well, I mean, I'm going to cash that, like, if if I can make sense of that at all, I'm going to make sense of that in terms of the just subjective attitudes of individual agents, right? So, um, you know, what it is for it to be fitting to favour X. So it's like something is, it is fitting to favour X from my perspective, if it's the case that I take, that I have a sort of positive attitude towards X or something like that. Um, and in that case, I, I mean, you might as well just cut out the middleman, as it were, and just go with a straightforward subjectivist account of value. So when we say X is valuable, I can just say, well, you know, I explain what it is for something to be valuable in terms of the subjective responses of individual agents. Um, now, if you say, well, X is valuable means it is fitting to favour X, well, I'm again just going to explain the fitting to favour X in terms of the subjective responses of individual agents. So, I mean, you, you might as well just cut out all of this stuff about fittingness and uh, go directly to the, to the point about it being a matter of subjective responses of individual agents. I don't really know if that made sense. Um, I, I hope it made some sort of sense. The point is, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I think that I would end up giving an account of what fittingness is that is just like purely subjectivist. And in that case, the fitting attitude account is not gonna be an alternative to, to subjectivist accounts from my point of view. Um, okay, attack dog. Uh, views on abortion. Well, my view is very straightforward. I think that if something is inside your body, it's perfectly fine to kill it. So um, I'm I'm fine with abortion. I think that uh, there should be no limit whatsoever on abortion. Abortion is um, it, it, again like if <laughs> right if if you got something in your body and you don't want it there, it's fine to kill it. That's my view. Um, so I actually, some, sometimes people say that my position on this is like really extreme, but it actually isn't because um, in terms of like what this means legally, it means Canada. That's what it means uh, because Canada has uh, enacted uh, what I would consider the ideal legal uh, restrictions with respect to abortion, which is that it has none. Um, in Canada, there's no... Um, legal prohibition like you can get uh, in principle legally some a woman in Canada can get an abortion at any time for any reason um, so uh, not only do I not think that my position is particularly extreme it's actually a position uh, at least with respect to the law um, it's a position which has already been enacted in a um, <laughs> you know an, a sort of average uh, first world nation let's say um, and so yeah um, uh, now, obviously, it, what what doesn't tend to happen is you don't tend to find uh, loads of women in the sort of eighth month of pregnancy who are just getting abortions for frivolous reasons. And in fact, in practice, I mean, it's going to be very, very difficult to find a doctor who would even be willing to perform that. Um, so, it, it, but but like legally and sort of so legally I don't think there should be any restrictions on abortion and morally I don't have an objection to it um uh, though so if you if you say well what about you know what about this hypothetical scenario where you know there's a woman who is in the eighth month of pregnancy and she just frivolously decides oh I want to go hiking in the Himalayas so I'm going to abort this kid um, and then for some reason she can find a doctor who's willing to perform that I mean what, like that situation is not something that's going to happen. But like, even if we kind of imagine a hypothetical scenario where it does happen, yeah, I'm fine with it. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, that's where I stand on abortion. Um, okay, um, Ben asks, uh, do you agree with Stirner's concept of the creative nothing? I see a fundamental incompatibility between Lacan and Stirner, but I'll describe the problem without Lacanian terms. It seems questionable that we construct our entire world as we wish. There are unconscious defences that prevent us from recognising what structures our experiences and rearranging them as we wish. There would be no way of surpassing involuntary egoism. There is no reality without fixed ideas or the discourse that a subject finds themselves in. It is impossible to take away the discourse. It can only be replaced. We don't control the unconscious which contains the symbolic signific signification of our world, to put it in Lacanian terms. Put in the most simple terms, do you think the creative nothing, or in other words, the ability to totally control and arrange our reality as we wish, is a view you would hold? Well, um, I don't know anything about Lacan, I should say that right off the bat, so um, I can't really frame any of this uh, with respect to Lacan. Um, so, okay, some some things about Stirner there. Um, okay, and so... Um, just so one note about Stirner's view. I, I don't think on Stirner's view there's really anything problematic about the notion that we sort of come into the world with particular features. You know, I mean, so uh, like, OK, I, I have a body, for instance, and the body is going to constrain what I can and can't do. Um, so if I like, OK, I'm taking myself to have a body. Right. And then like that body. Uh, has particular capacities and it imposes particular limits. Um, and that's sort of, in some sense, it's something that I, at least initially, um, just kind of find myself with. I mean, so before I start reflecting, before I start engaging in any sort of inquiry, before I start, you know, thinking about, thinking reflectively about myself and the world and all that stuff, I mean, I just, I'm just going to take it that I have a body. That's just the sort of conventional view and that has certain limits. Now, um, so if if it's if that's fine and it seems like Stirner would accept that, um, why would something like the unconscious mind be viewed any differently? I mean, so the unconscious mind is just going to be another. If there is an unconscious mind, it's just going to be another sort of thing that's that's kind of there. That at least initially that we we sort of come into the world with. Um, I, I I mean I guess I'm just not seeing what. Yeah, I'm not seeing what the what the problem is. Um, I also would say that this notion of so you say, do you think the creative nothing, in other words, the ability to totally control and arrange our reality as we wish? I think the notion of total control here is not something that uh, is that's not something I would really see in in Stirner. I mean, this uh, it seems to involve a sort of implicit kind of essentialism because what is it to have control over something? You know, what, like, what is it that has the control, right? I mean, if we're saying that, um, that I have total control, <clears throat> then that looks like it's going to require some sort of distinction between the self, namely, like, there's, there's a distinction between me, myself, and the world. There's a distinction between um, the kind of controlling thing, the controlling self, and the things that are controlled. Um, and... I mean, whatever it is that does the controlling is presumably going to be defined by some set of properties such that it can enact those powers, um, right? I mean, so, like, well, one property is going to be um, it, it has the capacity to control or give up control or something along those lines. Um, so if the, if we're saying that the, that the goal is, uh, if we're saying that what is distinctive of the self, what is distinctive of me is total control, then it looks like I'm kind of essentializing. Um, I have some. I have a sort of essentialist view of the self that's that's taking it to be identified with this notion of control. And then I'm. I guess Stoner would say, you know, I'm making myself a servant of like power or control or whatever. Um, I mean, and of course, you know, I mean, just sort of thinking about it in a more, I don't know, colloquial everyday sort of sense. Nobody really wants total control, do they? Uh, like, we want control in particular respects. Uh, and I think, um, it, like, there, there are certainly cases where you just sort of want the, you just want things to happen um, in a way that's kind of uncontrolled. Or you want, I mean, you might well want resistance from the world. That can be fun, right? Like, when you have, uh, when you are 
faced with something that is out of your control and that is not working in the way that you want, um, that creates like a challenge and that can be fun for at least some people. Um, and so, you know, the, the idea of sort of, of, of just having a kind of total control where, uh, where what, you're just never faced with any sort of challenges, that doesn't really even seem that appealing. Um, so I, I'm not sure that I would want to say that this notion of a creative nothing is supposed to be identified with the ability to control and arrange reality as as we wish. Um, I think that it's, I, I, I mean, okay, that's like one, that's one conception of a self, right? That's one conception of a self among many. Um, but if we take seriously the idea that uh, that it's nothing, that it's indefinable, um, then, okay, why are we, then, then I mean, that, that's not going to work, right? Like, we can't just define it as the ability to control. Um, so, okay, what, what do, I mean, do I, do I agree with Stoner's concept? I mean, I think it's interesting. I think, uh, um, okay, what, what do I agree with in, in Stoner? Well, I suppose I'm inclined to agree with the idea of awareness or consciousness as a kind of nothingness um, and the nothing and the nothingness uh, entails this sort of radical freedom um, I mean that that sort of core idea is one that I find quite appealing um, and also like more broadly the kind of anti-essentialist the constructivist elements of his views I find those quite appealing as well um, it's kind of hard to say whether I'm you know, I don't know, like, do I really, like, agree with Stirner? I'm not really sure I even understand Stirner, to be honest. I mean, I think there's a whole bunch of different ways of interpreting him, and uh, I'm... <laughs> yeah, so, and, and so uh, everything I've said here could just be completely mistaken, because, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I guess that answers the question, probably. Um, all right, Borders, uh, what are your thoughts about non-observable or single event predictions of scientific theories. For example, when physicists say that the universe began about four billion years ago with the Big Bang, or evolutionary biologists say something about the deep evolutionary history of mammals, what is your view as an anti-realist on these sorts of statements? Well, look, um, the, the standard anti-realist, the standard way of framing anti-realism is, okay, um, the point of scientific theories is to uh, systematize, predict, and control the observable phenomena. Um, I would take it... Now, my view is that stuff that happens in the past is not observable. Um, uh, like, we, so, you know, um, we can observe the evidence that... So we can observe things that we take to be evidence of past events, but, like, the past itself is um, is is just gone. Um, at least if we're assuming something like a standard model of... Um, uh, perception and time and so on, which you don't have to assume. I mean, like, um, I don't know, maybe you might say that uh, actually the past is, you might say, for instance, that when you have a memory, you're just directly observing the past. I and mean, you could say something like that. But like assuming a kind of standard model of, um, yeah, perception, time, etc., uh, then what happened in the deep evolutionary history of life is unobservable. Um, in 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 my view anyway um and so i would say that look when we make claims about the big bang or we make claims about the deep evolutionary history of mammals well these are just entailments of models which from an anti-realist perspective the models aim to systematize predict and control observables um so you know there's no like you can you can accept the model without believing those entailments um, I should say that this is actually a bit different from uh, from Van Frassen's view. Um, he would say that observability is, in some sense, a sort of... It's not exactly an intrinsic property of objects, but observability is going to be a matter of... Well, the way he puts it is, an object is observable if we would see it without instrumentation were we located in the right sort of place. So on his view, um, stuff that happened in the past is perfectly observable because, you know, if... So with, I don't know, the deep evolutionary history of mammals, like, if we went back into the past, 
then we would observe, um, you know, creatures developing in a certain way. I don't know. I... I, I, I find that I, I find that kind of unmotivated because I feel like you could sort of say the same thing about basically anything. You know, I mean, you could say, well, if we were shrunk down to the size of an atom, then we would observe such and such. Right? And so, you know, I mean, that, those sorts of counterfactuals just seem, um, it, it, yeah, unmotivated to me. So I'm, I'm kind of happy to just say, yeah, the past is unobservable. And um, so, you know, we could like to accept these scientific models does not require belief in what they postulate about the past. Um, okay, uh, what do you think are the causes for there being hardly any weirdness in mainstream popular culture now? In the 70s we had figures like David Bowie and Frank Zappa, now we seem to have a monoculture of tedium starring Gal Gadot. Uh, my, uh, my view is the escalating cost of living has meant those from less affluent backgrounds no longer enter art or culture whilst living off the, the dole and can no longer make a living from their work. I would be interested to hear your perspective. I don't really have a perspective on this. I, um, I don't know. I don't, I haven't, it's not something I've really thought that much about. Um, I would wonder, I mean, look, yeah, you, you may well be right. Um, the only thing I would say is that I don't know if, if like appealing to like rising cost of living and, you know, less affluence and so on. I, th I'm not sure if that can be in itself that much of an explanation because it seems like although, you know, we do have obviously, you know, there's lots of problems today, yes, but in many ways there has been a kind of overall increase in, in affluence. I mean, there's lots of ways in which, um, you know, somebody who, like the average person today um, or even like a poor person today might be better off than somebody who was born in, um, you know, the, the 1940s. Um, uh, so, I mean, I mean, like I've, I've said, you know, I mean, look, I've heard stories from my, my parents and so on of, uh, and grandparents of like life back then. It sounds like it was actually in some ways, you know, pretty, pretty hard. Um, but, but yeah, I, I mean, so I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer to this. Um, and I'm trying to say something interesting, but I just, I'm not coming up with anything. This is just, uh, I haven't thought about it. I don't know. Maybe, um, maybe like specialization of culture has something to do with it. So it's now the case that if you have an interest in any sort of unusual, so what's happening because of the internet, um, is that people can form these sort of communities um, and anything that's like slightly unusual, if you have an interest, slightly unusual taste, you can kind of find communities where everybody else shares that sort of interest. And so how does that, does that explain? I, I'm going to stop answering this question. I have nothing to say about this. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to move on. Sorry. Um, Balanga, what are your thoughts on psychedelics and their potential for philosophy? Uh, well, I think psychedelics are pretty fascinating. Um, I, I'm interested in psychedelics. The main issue that I would have with psychedelics is I'd be very concerned about having a bad trip. I've had panic attacks in the past, um, very severe panic attacks, uh, like it destroyed my life for a, a while. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't really want that to happen again. I think that the trouble I would have with psychedelics is that because I've had panic attacks in the past, as soon as I take the psychedelic, I would start worrying that it's going to cause a panic attack. And then my worry that it's going to cause a panic attack would then make it cause a panic attack. It would create a downward spiral. Now, there are ways around this, um, because you could just take the psychedelic and at the same time take some other drug that would prevent a panic attack. I'm aware of that, but I just, I, I don't know. I mean, like, when you start, like, having, like you know, taking drugs on top of drugs, I, it's just, a, you know, I mean, it's it's a whole, it's, it gets a bit dodgy, you know, I, I, I think the thing that I would say is this, if I was in, you know, like, a situation where I felt like totally comfortable and familiar, and I felt like I could control everything, and I knew exactly what was going on, um, then I might well, you know, be inclined to take uh, a psychedelic, um, but it, it, I, I mean, it, it'd really have to be the right sort of situation. So uh, that's that's my thought on psychedelics. Now, as for their potential for philosophy, I'm not really sure. I mean, you know, I have been told that 
so I've spoken to people who've used psychedelics and I've heard comments uh, for, sort of from others. I mean, I've been told that the use of psychedelics has changed certain people's views with respect to things like philosophy of mind. Not permanently, but uh, I mean, I'm not going to name names, but I have been told that there are I have been told that there are people who have taken psychedelics and then as a result of that, they've, um, you know, found, uh, you know, idealism or panpsychism or whatever much more plausible, right, after taking the psychedelic. But um, in I think they then change their minds again, you know, a little bit later, right? So it, it like had an effect for like a week. Like they became like more inclined to idealism or panpsychism for, you know, like a week. And then they went, then they changed back again, right? So, okay. But I mean, uh, yeah, so I don't know, maybe that tells you something about philosophy of mind, but that doesn't seem fundamentally different to any other way of altering one's mental states. I mean, there's just many... So I take it that, look, if you're interested in philosophy of mind, then you're probably, you should, probably should be interested in all of the different ways that consciousness can kind of manifest itself. You, you should be interested in all of the different states of mind that are available. Um, and so, you know, there's the sort of state of mind that a normal adult human has under normal conditions. And then there's the states of mind induced by psychedelics, the states of mind during sleep, there's states of mind after... Uh, getting some sort of brain damage and like all of these can potentially tell you something about philosophy uh, of mind um, so uh, yeah I mean I, I, I would I, I guess the way to put it is I would think that it's probably worth at least reflecting on um, the sorts of changes that psychedelics induce in conscious states um, now that doesn't mean that you have to use psychedelics yourself but uh you know, it seems like it's uh, something that you might want to consider. I mean, if you're in philosophy of mind, you might want to consider the sorts of effect that psychedelics have on the mind. Um, okay, then. C. Are there any good arguments that you can think of in favour of indifference towards political matters, or at least towards voting? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's plenty of... Okay, so here's a couple, right? So one way that you might end up indifferent in, in this context... So let's say that I'm somebody who's just not particularly interested in politics. Um, uh, you know, I mean, different people have different interests, right? Like, I just don't find politics, like, that engaging. Um, now, it, okay, so if I'm now being expected to vote for a particular party, well, I can think, okay, look, you know, these, these, there's these two parties, and it's going to require a lot of time to make a decision about which party to support. Um, different political parties have positions on a very wide range of issues. And, you know, in order to figure out which party to support, maybe I'm going to have to have a good understanding of a wide range of different areas. You know, so if if there's like different economic proposals or something, I'd have to I'd have to research. Um, I'd have to do research in economics to figure out where I stand with respect to those proposals. And, you know, that's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of effort. And you know what? I'm not really that interested in this. Um, like, why <laughs> So why would I put in that amount of time and effort? And then, you know, it, it, like, even when I figure out which party best aligns with my values, there's a whole bunch of other, like, considerations when it comes to voting because uh, I might decide that, you know, party A best aligns with my values, but maybe they're just a third party. Right. So maybe I might think, well, what's the point voting for a third party? They're definitely not going to win. Um, that would be a wasted vote. Um, I should vote for one of the two parties that might have a better chance of winning. Um, and so now I've got to, like, figure out how to weigh that. Like, OK, do I. So the point is, is that I don't I might think to myself, I don't have the relevant expertise and I don't have time to figure it out. OK. And that seems like a perfectly acceptable, you know, I, I don't know, what's wrong with that? That seems like a perfectly reasonable way of thinking to me. Um, so that's that's sort of one way you might get there. Another way you might get there is if you endorse uh, a, a kind of conspiratorial view of society, um, which I take to be... Uh, I, I take, I would say I take it sort of quite seriously, um, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that I, you know, I'm not like a conspiracy theorist exactly, but um, I just take it that 
there is that there is an enormous amount of like deception and propaganda and just kind of bullshit right being <laughs> being created um at like almost all levels of almost all institutions let's put it that way right so and if you agree with that sort of more cynical take on the way that human societies function if you think that there's just like kind of this constant deception and propaganda and so on um and and there's like if you think that um that people are driven primarily by self-interest um and that includes politicians so politicians are going to primarily work in their own self-interest or in the interests of perhaps their class rather than the country as a whole then i think that that could very reasonably lead you to a kind of um skepticism or pessimism about the very uh the whole like system of voting um and that doesn't seem to me unreasonable so um i mean again that's not exactly like a, a, a i don't know i haven't really given an argument there but uh those are a couple of perspectives from which i think somebody could you know arrive at the conclusion that they just are indifferent to um you know what politicians are doing or they're indifferent to voting and i don't think that those sorts of views are crazy so you know um what are your views on rights and rights talk i think that it's a perfectly fine way of expressing your values um i mean it, it you know it makes uh, it makes communication of my values easy and smooth so yeah i'm fine with talking about uh, rights um is there any good reason to care whether god exists for non-classical theists pantheists panentheists deists etc uh intellectual curiosity seems like a good enough reason to me um i mean i mean look uh if you're in philosophy then i assume you have to be motivated to some extent by intellectual curiosity right like that's probably playing uh, a big role in what got you into the discipline in the first place um what is left of moral theorizing once one becomes an anti-realist or a non-cognitivist in metaethics I think, you know, I mean, that's really going to depend on um, the anti-realist in question and, like, why they become an anti-realist in the first place. But broadly speaking, there's not anything that stops us from um, having moral, uh, uh, like, having moral commitments and from then constructing moral systems and criticising those systems. So I might well hold certain values um, and then I can try to figure out what follows from those values. Uh, so it may well be the case that I, you know, I want to have a set of moral commitments that are consistent, right? And, uh, and, and then I can sort of try to identify inconsistencies in my moral commitments. Or I might, um, I might want a set of moral commitments where I'm not like drawing arbitrary lines. So um, I can then like work through my moral views and try to identify places where I might be drawing arbitrary lines. Um, you know, that seems so. So actually, I think that, you know, a lot of um, a lot of what a realist, a moral realist does in moral theorizing, an anti-realist can do as well. Um, it's just an anti-realist is going to frame that in terms of uh, it's going to, they're going to frame it in terms of something about their own values rather than in terms of discovering the facts. Um, but, you know, I mean, if you think about how, as a, as a moral realist, right, how would you go about trying to convince somebody to change their mind, right? Well, it looks like all of the tools that you use are going to be the same as the tools that an anti-realist could use. So if you encounter somebody uh, who has different moral views to you and you want to change their mind, what are you going to do? Well, uh, you could try to identify some part of their moral system that is inconsistent or arbitrary. Well, an anti-realist can do that as well. Um, you could kind of try to... Uh, you could maybe, as a realist, you could try to uh, sort of show um, the the consequences of your moral system. You know, you could say, well, if you enact these values, this is going to happen. Um, and then hopefully that will appeal to them. Well, an anti-realist can do that as well. Uh, so, I mean, I just don't think that there's a significant difference in sort of how realists and anti-realists have to think about first order moral problems. Um, 
And so actually, I think there's probably, you know, from an anti, for an anti-realist, there's as much left of moral theorizing as you want there to be. I think that's probably how I would frame it. Um, Kazian, if you could be 20 again, what would you do differently? Um, I don't know, I'd probably just do what I enjoy right now. Uh, that's, you know, that's what I do. And that's different to what I enjoyed at 20. At least it's a little bit different. I have, you know, slightly different tastes. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I, other, other than that, I'd just be like, oh, great. You know, I'm 20. I've got, I've just been given, I guess, an extra like 11 years. Um, nice. I would just use it to enjoy myself. That's what, that's how I'm already using my time, and that's how I would use my time if I was 20. Um, Dolores Zhang, do you fear the uncertainty of your state after death more or the chaotic nature of events unfolding in life? Both have apparent properties of unknown, whether they are altogether unknowable or chaotic. Well, I, I guess death. I'm not as scared of death as I used to be, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I want to continue living. Um, and I have, I suppose, some pretty clear expectations about what's going to happen in my life. Whereas, you know, after death, it's it's much more, you know, <laughs> you, you really run into a fog with that one, right? I mean, there's like, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, uh, no, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm still more afraid of death than life. Uh, Dominic, do you think one must have a strong mathematics background to study modal logic? It would depend on how deeply you want to study it. I mean, I don't really know anything about maths, but I managed to pick up um, basic modal logic. Like, I think that you can... Logic isn't... Um, it's not, like, too difficult. I, I, so I think, you know, you can... What you would need as a background to study modal logic is you would need to understand, you know, propositional logic. Um, once you understand propositional logic, you can then move on to propositional modal logic. Um, and then... You know, if you then learn like quantified logic, well, you can learn quantified modal logic. So you need to understand the sort of you need to have some prior background in logic. But actually, even there, you don't need like a really detailed background. If all now that's the case, if all you just want, if all you want to do is just like learn a bit of modal logic, then, yeah, you don't really need much formal background. Um if you want to like get into it, if you want to get into it seriously, like, uh, and you want to be kind of making new discoveries and so on, then yeah, you probably need the the strong mathematics background for that. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, like, like I said, uh, if if you uh, if you're just sort of interested in it, um, just because you, you, I don't know, just for its own sake, then um, it's relatively straightforward to pick up. You'd want to, as I say, learn a bit of propositional logic first. Um, and, and then you can do modal logic. Um, good, good introduction is, uh, Rod Girl's Modal Logic for Philosophers, I think, I think the book is. Um, and then there was, uh, James Garson, I think is his name. I could be getting this wrong. Uh, has a textbook on modal logic. Those are the ones I used. And as I said, I didn't have a strong mathematics background, um, or really even like a strong logic background. I mean, like I knew... I'd learned some logic and then I learned some modal logic. You know. um, drag 07878. What are numbers? Are they objective or subjective? Why do they exist if there is no higher intelligence? I would say numbers are sort of abstractions and abstractions are mental constructions. Um, I, I don't think numbers sort of exist independently of minds or languages or, any, you know, or anything like that. Um, uh, so... Uh, I mean, why do they exist if there's no higher intelligence? I mean, I think actually no, like in, it's it's like intelligence that does bring numbers into existence. So um, I guess I, I disagree with the um, with the presupposition of that question. Um, Edgar Kerr, in the past AMA, you said that one of your arguments to why you don't believe in God is because he is all good and it is impossible to be all good since moral statements are meaningless. So even if there was a God, he cannot make moral statements true. But God cannot be wrong. So if he says something is good, then it is so. Why is this impossible? It's a good point. That's actually a good point. If there was a God, then God could bring moral... Like, it could make it the case that there are stance-independent moral values. Maybe he could do that. Um, I mean, I suppose the question here is, can God do anything? Um, well... Traditionally, the answer would be no. He can't do what is logically or conceptually impossible. Um, 
And so we might say, you know, I mean, if, if you're a non-cognitivist uh, in metaethics, then you might say that actually the, 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 the like realist conceptions of um, moral value is, are just logically impossible. So like if, you know, so if slavery is wrong means boo to slavery, well, then it just doesn't make sense to say that there's like this property of wrongness, um, at least not in a, 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 a not in any sort of substantive sense. I mean, you might be able to give like some sort of deflationary account of properties where, uh, you know, like the fact that we can assert slavery is wrong means that slavery has the property of wrongness. Like, uh, but but like that. I, I mean, there's not really <laughs> like uh, a property of wrongness out there. Right. So. Um, and, and so, yeah, if if when I say slavery is wrong, it just means boo to slavery, then like ha like the it, it would just be a, a kind of conceptual impossibility that there's this like property of wrongness. And so um, moral properties on that view might might be conceptually impossible. And then on the traditional view where we say that God is limited by logical or conceptual possibility, uh, it, it then will be the case that God can't make um he can't make it the case that you know something is good or that something has the property of goodness uh but you know i would say that look i mean <clears throat> i'm not a theist but it seems to me that taking god to be you know limited by by logic or conceptual possibility or whatever that that strikes me as a remarkably diminished view of god uh like yeah so uh so why the hell not i mean you know what i think i think maybe you're right um maybe <laughs> Maybe God could do that, and so I should have to retract that particular argument um, against the existence of God. Okay, uh, is it a successful criticism of the error theory, which consists in the fact that two contradictory moral statements cannot be false at the same time? Therefore, if moral statements can make true values, then they cannot all be false at the same time. I've heard an answer like that any moral statement is a statement about the real world to which an unreal property is attributed, and therefore it is false. But then it is unclear what is the difference between statements that attribute some moral properties and statements that contain moral properties. For example, moral properties are unreal. Is this a moral statement or not? Is it true or false? Um, well, moral moral properties are unreal would, I think, naturally be interpreted as a meta-ethical statement. Um, so that can be true. Uh, I'm not sure what the issue is with just saying that that statement is true. I mean, it's not a, it's not a foot. So the natural interpretation of that statement is that it's a statement about meta ethics. It's not a like first order moral statement. Um, I mean, I think it's worth bearing in mind actually that in a sense, error theory does not claim that all moral statements are false. So consider the statement, slavery is not wrong, or it is not the case that slavery is wrong. Well, actually, those statements, according to the error theorist, are true. Um, they're true because there is no such thing as wrongness, right? There is no property of wrongness. So, yeah, it's it's not the case that slavery is wrong. Um, now, where you have to be careful is that when we're sort of thinking within the ethical framework, so when we're, when we're like, uh, you know, adopting the conceptual framework of morality, and we say something like slavery is not wrong, that would be interpreted as entailing slavery is permissible. So, you know, when we're thinking in moral terms and we say slavery is not wrong, that just means slavery is permissible. So, uh, but so, so, and like, so I guess the way to think about it is that within the kind of conceptual framework of morality, that entailment holds, that's fine. But error theory rejects that whole framework, right? So, um, the error theorist will say it's not the case that slavery is wrong and it's not the case that slavery is permissible. It just doesn't have any moral property at all. Um, I mean, you know, it's... I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, it, it, so it's, it's sort of like, um, you know, if if we say that, uh, that like, th there's, there's, there's other sorts of conceptual frameworks where we have just rejected, like, the whole framework um so you know you might when when you're talking you know within the conceptual framework of phlogiston theory say you might say that like some substance 
So if I say that this substance is not releasing phlogiston, then maybe within the conceptual framework of that theory, that would just be taken to entail that that substance continues to contain phlogiston or that that substance is still... So if I say like, this is not... So this particular gas is not dephlogisticated. Well, then that's going to entail that the gas is phlogisticated, thinking within the framework of phlogiston theory. But we re reject phlogiston theory. Like we just say that, no, that whole theory is just wrong. There's no such thing as phlogiston. So yeah, I mean, this gas is not release. It's not releasing phlogiston. It hasn't been dephlogisticated, but that doesn't mean that it's still phlogisticated. Um, that doesn't mean it still has phlogiston within it. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, y you know, like that's the thing to, to sort of bear in mind here is um, that the error theory will technically judge certain moral statements to be true but really so when an error theorist says slavery is not wrong that's not really a moral statement they're not stating that within the moral conceptual framework because they just reject that framework um okay you say you argued that people should give up eating meat because animal husbandry and the meat industry cause great damage to humanity is the same thesis true for the fishing industry yeah i mean fishing is a total disaster as far as i can tell um so <laughs> It's probably a good idea to move away from that as well. Um, Emmanuel Perez, does time exist independently of the mind? Um, so, I, I mean, my take on this sort of question is, <clears throat> I'm a constructivist, and I take it that the mind-dependent, mind-independent distinction is a distinction that is drawn within a particular model or within a particular perspective. Um, now, most of the models that postulate time are constructed such that time occurs independently of those, independently of the mind in those models. So in, in many, so in many of the models that we accept, when we think about like, you know, when we try to model the world around us, um, well, we draw this distinction between like objective time that orders the events on the mind independent side. So there's like this mind independent ordering of events. So within the model, there's a mind independent ordering of events. And then there's what you might call like the subjective time, the sense of the passage of time. Um, and I, I mean, I guess the point is, is that like in when, when we sort of think about the world and model the world, time um, as in the sort of ordering of events, uh, that's as objective as um as any ordinary object right it's as objective as the computer in front of me um so in so i would say that the computer in front of me for instance is mind independent because i'm just going to take it that you know when i walk out the room and i'm no longer thinking of the computer the computer's still there um and that's the sort of model that i use um when you know dealing with the world i just take most of these objects around me to exist independently of the mind. Um, and time, uh, I mean, is going to play a sort of similar role, right? Um, but again, like all of this is within a constructivist framework. You don't have to draw a distinction between mind-dependent and mind-independent things. Um, or if you do draw that distinction, you might sort of draw it in a strange way or in a more unusual way. Um, so I, I just don't think there's any, like, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's any facts of the matter here, right? Um, okay, so, yeah. I mean, does time exist independently of the mind? Um, I, I suppose what I would say is is that time exists independently of the mind in the same sense that, you know, ordinary objects exist independently of the mind. Um, but, um, yeah. Um, okay, so exalted kitharode. So, I mean, you ask a whole bunch of different questions about scepticism. Um, do I have to read all of these out? Uh, so, um, okay, firstly, uh, what is the nature of the entities that you commit yourself to when you accept typical sceptical arguments? Um, uh, okay, so I'm going to start with this question, and I think that my answer to this probably answers the other questions as well. Um, I take it that, I mean, first of all, um, what sceptical argument are we talking about here? There's different sceptical arguments. But generally speaking, I would say that a sceptical argument is something that can proceed from within 
you know, a given framework. And we can use the sort of tools of that framework to undermine the framework itself. So, you know, you can sort of show how from within a particular framework, um, the framework ends up like, you know, being dismantled. You can kind of dismantle the framework from within itself. Um, so, I mean, okay, uh, if, suppose, for instance, you're talking to somebody who um, believes the Bible and then you read the Bible and you find there's a statement in the Bible which says that the Bible is a work of fiction and it shouldn't be trusted. Um, you could use that as a sort of tool to criticise this person's belief in the Bible. And in fact, notice that you don't even need to be part of this equation. So if there's a person, just one person, who believes the Bible and then they read the Bible and they see that it contains this statement that the Bible is a work of fiction and is not to be trusted, they can think to themselves, hmm, should I trust the Bible? Maybe not, right? So I, I would want to say that with scepticism, I, I think a lot of your questions here are, are sort of trying to saddle the skeptic with like a position. And I, I'm not sure that skepticism really is a position. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure that, that, that there needs to be a skeptic, right? Like, so the key thing about, so the key thing I would say is, first of all, you don't need a skeptical interlocutor. You can, when you when you look at these skeptical arguments, you can just present them to yourself. It doesn't matter where the arguments come from, right? So when I look at something like a Gripper's trilemma, or I look at, you know, Hume's, um, Hume's argument against reason, or, or whatever, like, it, I mean, who cares about the provenance? Who cares what's being assumed when somebody gives these arguments? That doesn't matter. I can just look at those arguments and reflect on them myself, and then I can think, you know, what does that what follows about, you know, my, my views, my beliefs. Um, and I mean, I can, I can kind of think about it from within whatever framework I currently accept. And maybe it might well be the case that reflecting on these arguments leads me to end up uh, becoming less confident in whatever framework it is I accept. Um, so I, I think that in general, I would just say generally speaking, when people try to attack skepticism and skeptical arguments by showing that oh, these sceptical arguments actually rely on assuming X, Y, Z, etc. That always strikes me as a very, a very lame sort of move. And it strikes me almost as, I don't know, kind of like... I, it's sort of... Uh, look, again, like you can just ask yourself these questions. It doesn't matter what the sceptic believes. Just ask yourself the sceptical questions. Um, so, okay. Um, yeah, I think that... Uh, um, right. So, so some more of your questions. Is the skeptic's typical reliance on, roughly speaking, mental vocabulary of beliefs and agents of those beliefs leave any possibility of genuinely neutral ground, or do they automatically favour idealism or anti-realism, which are constructive positions, not purely critical positions after all? Um, I don't think the skeptic needs to rely on beliefs and agents and so on. I mean, you can frame a lot of sceptical arguments that way, but it doesn't seem to me that it needs to rely on it. Similarly, um, you ask, does scepticism presuppose some minimal psychological theory? Nope, I don't think it presupposes anything in particular. Um, um, yeah, I feel like I, again, I think that what I've said there probably answers these other questions. And if it, if it doesn't, you know, maybe you can, you can, call me a prick in the comments or something. I like, just, just tell me in the comments if you feel like that what I've said has not answered these other questions. Um, okay, yeah, I think I think what I've said probably uh, should serve as as an answer to the rest of them. Um, so I'm going to move on. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, so, do you have? a response to a critique of psychologism. You seem to favour some psychologistic manoeuvres. Well, it would depend on the critique. There are many critiques of psychologism. So, um, uh, so the standard ones, let's go through some of the standard ones then. I mean, so, so yes, I, I think that psychologism is, I don't know if I would say that I endorse psychologism, but um, I, I don't think it's ever like been refuted and uh, it seems to me to have quite a lot going for it. Um, so, uh, okay, the some of the standard critiques. So um, it's sometimes said, for instance, that we're not going to be able to reduce logic to psychology because logic is a priori, whereas psychology is a posteriori. Well, my answer to that is logic is not a priori. Um, 
I think that we can develop logical systems a priori. So we can develop formal systems. We, you know, we just sort of sit on an armchair and develop these systems. But that's, I, I mean, you know, that's just kind of, we're just playing a game, right? Like, you know, we, we, that, that doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't apply to anything. If we're taking logic as a theory of reasoning, as a theory of correct reasoning, that's not a priori in my view. So I see logic as a kind of idealization. Um, in my view, uh, we have sort of natural language, natural reasoning, natural inferences, you know, the sort of everyday reasoning and inferences that people engage in. And then we create these abstract, idealized, formal models of parts of natural language. Um, and so I, I would say that, you know, what, like what we're doing there is we're, we're taking, we can take a natural language argument and you can construct a, a formal idealized model of it. Now, in my view, it's not the case that any particular natural language argument has a sort of logical form that inheres in it uh, necessarily, or that it, that it doesn't have any like essential logical form. Um, and moreover, I don't think that you know, there's there's sort of one universal sort of set of rules of logic or anything like that. So, um, I mean, I'm very much a kind of instrumentalist about logic. But, um, for example, let's take the argument. Um, so here's, an, here's an, a very simple argument. Uh, Cain is a philosopher. Therefore, a philosopher exists. Um, well, how do we... For so first of all, we might ask, how do we formalise that in terms of a particular logical system? Well, one option, if we're just using, you know, propositional logic, um, we'd say that the formal structure of this argument is P, therefore Q. Um, now, another option, we might we might de desire a bit more sophistication than that. So another option for formalising it, we could say um, a, a sort of A is P, therefore there exists an X such that X is P. Um, now, you know, I, I don't think that... that there's any like fact of the matter what the real form of the argument is. Um, there's just different ways of formalizing it. And now you notice that um, P therefore Q, that's going to come out as invalid in pretty much any logical system, right? Um, but uh, <laughs> A is P, therefore there exists an A such that A is P. Um, th that's going to come out valid in classical logic. Uh, so we have like one way of formalizing the argument where it's not valid. We have another way of formalizing it that it is valid, at least in classical logic. Um, and I just take And so, you know, I mean, I, I don't think there's like a fact no matter what the right way of formalizing it is. Um, you know, we we choose the means of formalization that is, you know, most useful, most fruitful for whatever our purposes are. Um, now, of course, uh, you know, so so one step here is formalizing natural language arguments. Then, of course, there's this other step of assessing the validity. And there's a whole bunch of different logical systems for doing that. Now, I mean, classical logic is a very powerful system, um, but I don't see it as being like, you know, the one true logic or the logic that, you know, we ought to use or in all circumstances or anything like that. Um, when I say, you know, so the, the, the inference that, um, you know, A, A is P, therefore there exists and uh, an X such that X is P, um, that's going to come out invalid in some other uh, non-classical systems. Um, and, you know, like, is the inference really valid or really invalid? Uh, I don't think there's a fact of the matter about that. So, um, so yeah, so all of this is to say, I don't think logic is a priori. Um, or at least, I think that you, what's a priori is, yeah, you can you can invent these formal systems, but what's not a priori is the theory of correct reasoning. Um, okay, so that's that's one point, right? So so one standard critique of psychologism is this idea that logic is a priori, psychology is a posteriori. I don't think that works. Um, when we're providing logic as a theory of correct reasoning, I take that to be a posteriori. Um, another standard critique is that logic is normative, whereas psychology is descriptive. Well, I mean, the answer to that is very straightforward. I just don't think that logic is normative. And I have a video on that. I released a video a little, just a little while ago called Is Logic Normative? And uh, I, I, you know, present the uh, the anti-normativist case. Um, 
So another sort of argument is uh, the idea that logic is supposed to be like universal, whereas uh, kind of logic kind of covers everything in some sense. You know, it's it's complete. It's it's wholly general. Whereas psychology is obviously, um, you know, psychology just provides very very specific descriptions of a specific species. Um, you know, psychological laws are derived from studying humans. Um, well, I mean, again, you know, the answer to that is that logic is, I just take it that logic is not universal. Um, I mean, we adopt particular logics that are useful for formalizing arguments. And if we were to encounter, um, you know, an alien species <clears throat> who were giving arguments, then we might use these same formal systems for, un for formalizing what they're saying. Um, that's fine. Uh, but I, I mean, you know, I don't really take it that like, yeah, that, that logic is universal. Um, so, okay, uh, those were some of the standard critiques of psychologism and some very brief responses. Hopefully that uh, answered that question. Um, finally, you ask, what is your ontology of criteria standards rules? What happens when you change your criteria of individuation of some sort of object? Would you spell it out in terms of your behaviour, intuitions, impressions, some non-mental items... It seems that normative anti-realists still suppose that there are many different possible rules, not just just not universally valid. But how is this understood in their ontology? Uh, same question goes about the metaphysical status of concept versions in metascepticism. Um, I don't have an ontology of rules, unfortunately. Um, I would probably say that when we talk about criteria, standards, rules, that's potentially referring to many different things. I don't know. I mean... Uh, I mean, you ask, would I spell it out in terms of behavior, intuitions, impressions, some non-mental items? And I'm inclined to just say, yeah, seems like those would all be very reasonable ways of spelling out um, what it is to have uh, a certain criteria or a certain rule. I mean, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I like, I don't know. This isn't something I've really thought about that much. Um, now, if the cl I, I don't know i mean is there a problem there is there supposed to be some issue that like hinges on exactly what our ontology of you know criteria or rules is uh um i don't know maybe there is um but i haven't as i said i haven't really thought about it um okay so frozen tomb in which ways did sterner affect the way you see the world and would you consider him a major influence um I don't know. Philosophy never really changed. It's not. It's not really had any notable impact on my life. Um, so uh, I don't think that. I don't know. Maybe it did. I'm not really very reflective about like this sort of thing. So um, I would say that Stirner's work is very interesting, and um, you know, it's probably influenced my views in some ways. But uh, it's kind of hard to identify exactly what that influence was i mean uh, you know when when, it, when i was re reading stoner um like a lot of what i kind of drew, drew from stoner it, it's like i i don't know man i mean I, I i i i read other things and then sometimes i might see connections to some of the things stoner was saying um and yeah this is a hard question i, I don't like this question i don't know how it affected the way i see the world how am i supposed to know that i mean like what I, I, like, I, look i just read stuff i'm interested in it and then i form beliefs about things and uh you know that's about it i'm sorry this that that was a bit aggressive i don't mean to be rude right it's just i i don't like having to you know reflect on like this sort of thing you know i mean i can i i, I just I, I like philosophy. I like doing philosophy, okay? But having to sort of ask, like, how did philosophy change the way I see the world? I don't know. I mean, I just find it interesting. And so I do it for that reason. And, um, you know, uh, like, how did Sterner... Did did he... Would I... I don't, I don't know the answer to this question. Um, man, what's happening here? This is like... I'm going to leave this in. The, the video I'm not going to edit this out but um I'm not really like I don't know why I responded that way to that question um I really you know I'm, I'm so I'm kind of sorry and I'm, I'm sort of now I'm trying to think about like okay so how would I respond to it if I'm being a bit more sensible right like if I'm um if I'm not just having a weird like brain fart but 
what is it why did that question bother me um that's something to think about why was i bothered by that question um in what way did Stirner affect the way you see the world and would you consider him a major influence? In what way did Stirner affect the way you see the world? Why am I bothered by that? Um, it's not anything to do with Stirner. If you asked me that about Hume or Feyerabend or any other philosopher that I like, I would have responded, I think, the same way. In what way did he, did he how did he see the world? The way you see the world. Philosophy doesn't really affect the way I see the world. And... Um, and and I, I, I don't know what more to say. Um, I'm not sure why this question bothered me so much. But, uh, you know, it did. And um, and so that's something I'm going to have to think about. Because th that's weird. Why, why, did, why was I bothered by that? I don't know. But I'll have to think about it and get back to you. Maybe in the next AMA. Um, okay, so have you tried magic mushrooms? No, I have not. Are you familiar with Richard Rorty and his concept of ironism and final vocabulary? Um, well, uh, I know a bit about Rorty. Um, there's parts of Rorty that I like a lot. I, I really like his kind of anti-essentialism. I like his relativist inclinations, although, of course, he didn't he didn't like to call himself a relativist. Um, but he was. Uh, but um, the, the stuff about like ironism and so this is more his kind of political stuff. And I don't know. I mean, in terms of his politics, I don't know a lot about him but from what i've read of his political views he seems just kind of dull i mean like he's this sort of reformist liberal um just like most other people in academic philosophy i mean look i don't care much about political philosophy anyway um if if i'm gonna do political philosophy if i'm gonna like read political philosophy it's got to be cool you know it's got to be something radical and extreme and for some reason rorty you know despite how uh, kind of radical he was in other ways it doesn't seem like his political views were particularly radical so um, unfortunately I've just never found him that engaging um, <clears throat> so you ask what do you think about philosophical Taoism well I think that from the very little I know of it it presents a kind of interesting alternative to the sort of stuff that we tend to value in philosophy you know I mean we value in intellect rationality reason progress all of that stuff um, and, uh, and, and I, and, and, you know, that at least as I understand, um, Taoism, it, it, it offers a very different kind of set of virtues, let's say. Um, I tend to agree with the kind of skepticism with respect to like the pursuit of desires and the pursuit of control, as it were. Um, it's not clear to me that, you know, pursuing one's desires really helps improve well-being. Um, at the same time, I can say that this has had absolutely no influence on my life whatsoever. Um, I just, you know, me personally, like, I do just pursue whatever my desires are in a fairly unreflective sort of way. Um, that's just how I live. And um, I'm, I'm fine with it, basically, even if it doesn't uh, help me in terms of my overall well-being. Um, I'm happy to just plow ahead. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, I, well, yeah, that's what I think of that. Um, furniture canon of Ushi Ashura I don't even I don't know what that word is. Furniture canon asks, "What is your opinion on terror management theory?" I have no opinion on it whatsoever. I've never heard of it before. Um, Giraffe, what are your thoughts on Taoism? Well, I've just answered that question. Um, if you look at my answer to Frozen Tomb, Harmonica Luke, yo yo, I've been toying with the idea that the Munchausen Agrippa's trilemma embraces our well mapped out methods of confabulation and post hoc justification, but confuses this for how we learn things going forwards in time. If I get to something I cannot provide a post hoc justification for now without resorting to circularity, that doesn't to me clearly indicate that when I initially adopted that belief, it was an unjustified assumption, should it? Um, I think that we can frame Agrippa's trilemma as a question. Um, so I can just ask the question, what, it, it, like when I'm, when I'm giving these sorts of, these sorts of skeptical problems, right? Like I can just ask the question, what is the justification for the beliefs that I currently hold? Right? Like, in, so in general, right? Like when I'm, when I'm, in, when any skeptical argument like this, I can frame it. I, I can frame it as a question: um, What is the justification for the beliefs I currently hold? So, even if my beliefs were justified when I formed them, 
how's that going to help me now? Right. Like, I mean, I don't know, maybe it is, right. Maybe it is the case that the belief that when I initially adopted the belief, it was justified. Um, OK, but like now I hold the belief and I want to know what the justification is for continuing to believe it. Um, and, and so, you know, I mean, like, I mean, it doesn't seem to help. Right. I mean, just unless, of course, you just make the assumption that the belief was justified. Um, the mere fact that it might have been justified when you formed it is not really going to be much help. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think so does Agrippa's trilemma. So does it. So, OK, it embraces our mapped out methods for confabulation and post hoc justification, but confuses us for how we learn things going forward in time. OK, so, OK, let's say that I am in the process of forming a belief, right? Um, it seems like I can apply Agrippa's trilemma here because so as I'm forming, so I don't currently hold the belief. I form the belief. Now, as I'm in that process of forming the belief, I can think, all right, well, I, w w why should I hold this belief? And then it's going to either be that the belief is just an assumption or it's going to be that the belief is based on some circular chain of reasons or it's going to be that the belief is a product of an infinite regress extending back in the past. Now, in, in, in this case, I assume that we can actually we really can rule out the the infinitism if so if we're taking this not as so if we're taking the trilemma not as a claim about the structure of justification kind of just abstractly speaking but if we're taking it instead and applying it to how it is that we form beliefs in the first place well i think we really do just have two options um you know i th there's an assumption uh, th the belief can begin as an assumption or it can be um, the end result of some chain that terminates in an assumption, or it can be the result of, or it can be part of a circular loop. And that's, that's all we've got, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't, so, and, and it seems like none of those seem satisfactory in terms of, you know, providing me a justification for forming this belief. Um, so actually, I, th I would wonder if maybe this trilemma is, is sort of, I don't know, I mean, it seemed like maybe maybe worse, right? Like the, the situation seems worse if we start thinking in terms of uh, what it is that has caused us to form beliefs, because it, that just cuts off um, the infinitist possibility. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I mean, so yes, it seems seems like it's still going to be a problem, however you frame it. But uh, yeah. Helvetica Neptune asks, I like to ask what you think of backpacking. Well, you know, I would be very interested in seeing all sorts of places in the world. Um, uh, you know, visiting mountains and forests and lakes and all that stuff that sounds wonderful. But the, the, the problem is this. I, um, I, I really hate um, motion. OK, I don't like moving ever under any circumstances. I, I would prefer... Uh, my ideal life would just be spent laying in bed. Okay, I don't ever like to have to move anywhere. Um, I I certainly don't like any kind of vigorous exercise. Now I should say I do perform exercise. I I actually what I usually do for exercise is I usually run up and down the stairs. So I'll do twenty minutes a day at least, sometimes more, but at least twenty minutes a day I do a bit of jogging up and down the stairs. Um, and uh, you know I, I I try to get five minutes of sort of doing a few other things yeah uh, maybe like jumping jacks or something but so i will do exercise but the only reason why i do it is because it's something that is required in order to stay healthy um that's the only reason um and uh, it infuriates me that i have to do it i, I mean in it, it's horrible i absolutely fucking hate it i have always hated any kind of exercise I, I, I've tried lots of different things. Um, I've tried, I mean, well, damn, when I was in school, I mean, I had to, I was sort of forced to try all sorts of different sports. And then, you know, I mean, things like swimming and, uh, you know, running and uh, uh, rock climbing. I remember trying that once. You know, so I've tried lots of different things and I hate all of them. I don't like moving. I want to just sit down and turn into a blob. OK, but um, again, you can't really do that. So, so that is one of the issues with backpacking okay is that it, it, it i think it would be you know fine if i was like 
if I was doing it with somebody that, um, you, you know, like with a friend or something, and you know, we could that that would make it better. But I, I wouldn't do it on my own. I mean, there's no way I would do it on my own. Um, uh, but you know, I mean, if I was with somebody that I was a good friend and it was a, a, a an interesting place that we were seeing, then yeah, I mean, it would be it would be worth it. Um, but it's just a shame that um, I don't know. It's a shame that I uh, just ended up in a body that, that hates exercise so much. <laughs> um, Himalayan Tom Tai verisimilitude. Should a futanari have balls or not? Um, I didn't know what a futanari was. Uh, I looked them up and, I mean, I, I, I don't have any opinion on that. Um, I would say that uh, whatever way works for you is the way you should draw it. Um, you know? Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Human evolution. Why your beard? He why your beard? Hella basic. Uh, because I'm I'm lazy and uh, I can't. I just I'm just not shaving. I can't be bothered. I'm just lazy. That's it. That's why. Um, why are the Stoics the greatest philo philosophy school of antiquity yet not mentioned as much in the textbooks? I'm not the right person to ask about this because first of all, I don't know a lot about the Stoics. From what I do know about them, they sound like a bunch of dorks, and I don't really agree with any of their like metaphysical or ep epistemological views or whatever. So, I mean, they don't seem that great to me. Um, but I don't know. Maybe I just haven't read the right ones. Um, okay, I'm gonna take a little break right now. I'm hungry. I'm gonna go get some dinner and come back to this in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, Inventive Harvest asks, what do you think of Emir Lakatosh's philosophy of science? Well, you know, I mean, so Lakatosh was um, one of those, so he was still in that sort of phase of philosophy of science where philosophers of science were trying to come up with like grand theories of uh, all of science in general. And I mean, those sorts of theories, I, you know, some of them tell us interesting things, but I think it's... Um, they tell us interesting things about specific scientific developments, but then they usually run into lots of problems when you uh, try to treat them as like overall theories of how science works. Um, in order to make Lakatosh's model fit all of science, there's a whole lot of finessing that's uh, that's required, or you know you sort of have to add like so many qualifications to the model or make it so vague that it's not clear that it's saying anything substantive anymore. Um, so I mean, I mean, I don't know. So some, I guess, uh, I guess, general comments on this. I think so. So on Lakatosh's view, I mean, I, I think that I, I'm, I, I have problems with the way that he thought about uh, rationality. Um, so on his view, when we look at the history of science, um, we're supposed to reconstruct scientific development in our historical account so as to make it maximally rational. Like we have to propose. A methodology that uh, we have to propose that science operates according to methodological principles where uh, those methodological principles um, would make science would make the developments of science rational developments and I mean so Lakatosh he calls that internal history that's the internal history of science is like the uh, the way that scientific theories develop is in accord with these principles of rationality um, and but then of course you have the external history um, which is going to account for, uh, you know, maybe things like the speed at which scientific theories developed, or it's going to account for irrational deviations from these, you know, rational principles. Um, to me, I don't know. I mean, this whole kind of way of approaching um, thinking about science, it, it, I, I, I find it misguided. Um, I think that, you know, I, I, the the way to if you're going to do something like history of science, the way to to do it is to, you know, just exhibit the development of science and talk about, you know, t tell us what the causes of theory change are. There's no need to make any particular judgment about whether you know certain causes of theory change are rational or irrational. Um, and you know, not, I, I don't, I certainly don't see any reason prima facie. To, to say that when we are looking at the history of science, we have to take it that science operates according to methodological principles that maximize the rationality of science. There's no, I, I wouldn't take it to be a prima facie assumption that science is in fact a rational endeavor in the first place. Um, so I, I, I think there are, yeah, there are issues I have with the way he thought about like the rationality of science. Um, and I mean, 
you know, so like, let's say, so I, th I think I also agree with, with this point that Feyerabend makes, right? That like, um, it, you know, in, in practice, right? If you look at it from the sort of point of view of, um, can, like somebody who's looking at science as it is now, um, it's not really going, the, the theory isn't really going to tell us anything about, um, you know, what sorts of uh, proposals are rational or irrational. Um, you know, it, so the whether or not a particular research tradition is progressive or degenerating, well, that's something that is determined as it were, retrospectively. I mean, you can say, so I could say right now that, you know, there's a particular research tradition that is degenerating, but then I might sign up to that research tradition and I might make some proposals for how to change it. And then as I'm making those proposals, there's just no way of telling right now whether those are going to be progressive or whether they're going to continue the degeneration of the program. Um, because, you know, I mean, like, look, a program that's degenerating can make a comeback. Um, similarly, a program that's progressive can start degenerating. Um, so, you know, we're like, we determine whether something is progressive or degenerating retrospectively. Um, and then similarly, I think that all of these other, you know, aspects of Lakatosha's model end up being determined retrospectively. So if you think about this idea that um, scientific theories are supposed to have the hard core that is maintained throughout the research program versus the protective belt that changes, I think that's something that, that we determine retrospectively. Um, so, for instance, if you look at the history of Darwinism, um, the Saltationists, like Hugo de Vries, the Saltationists proposed that new species can emerge by sudden mutations. So they proposed that, um, you know, the origin of species did not occur through gradual change. It occurred in like these mutation events that produced kind of you know monsters um, and very occasionally there would be a monster that would uh, you know just so happen to survive and reproduce now um the hugo de reason the saltationists a lot of them saw themselves as really serious darwinians um for for them you know the hard core of darwinian theory was its commitment to things like common descent um now what but then what happened later after Darwinism was, um, af after, you know, Darwinism was married to Mendelian genetics, uh, the, 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 the assumption was is that, well, actually part of the hard core of Darwinism is a commitment to gradual change. Um, and so I think that what probably happens is that what we count as the hard core of a theory is just going to be whichever parts of the theory happen to survive over time. Um, in fact, I suspect even, you know, so, or, or rather what accounts as the hardcore of a research program is whatever, it's just whatever happens to survive over time. I suspect that more generally, like, yeah, like even what counts as a research program in the first place is probably something that's determined retrospectively. So, you know, I think that, um, like if I'm in a, a situation where like I'm, I'm sort of signing up to a research program and I want to know, like, am I, am I making like a rational or irrational decision in, you know, some particular theory I'm proposing or, or whatever? Um, well, I mean, let's say that, you know, I decide to uh, switch from research program X to research program Y. Well, later it turns out that Y is preferred, you know, Y ends up displacing X. Um, but when I when I make that decision to switch from research program X to research program Y, is that a rational decision? Well, um, I, I mean, I guess there's a couple of things you could say here. You could say that when I make the decision, there's just no facts of the matter about whether it's rational. It becomes rational later. Um, or you could say that at the time I made the decision, it it was rational, but there's just no way there was no way for me to tell. Um, I mean, either way, it doesn't seem to me that this concept of rationality is really doing much work. Um, and so I suppose my feeling on this is that there's the, the issues that so, so the issue is, right, this concept of rationality is supposed to be playing an important role, but there's no way to make judgments of rationality in the moment, like in the present, okay? We can make these judgments retrospectively, but not in the present. And then also at the same time, um, 
when we look at the history of science, we have to kind of bifurcate it in this weird way. Like, so some developments in science are explained in terms of methodological principles of rationality. Other developments of science are explained in terms of, you know, other types of causes, you know, so we then bring in sociology and psychology to explain these other developments in science. So this concept of rationality ends up like, first of all, like not doing any work in the present and secondly, like bifurcating our view of the history of science in what seems to me to be a weird way. Um, so uh, I suppose those are some general concerns that I would have about the uh, the sort of model that Lakatos proposes. Um, you know, and so I, I guess that answers that question. Um, okay, uh, Jax, uh, can you figure out exactly why it is you think your audience hates me in particular? So Jax is somebody that I've done um, some videos with uh, and the reception is quite negative. Um, my audience really seems to hate Jax. And um, so why is it that the audience hates Jax in particular? Um, well, uh, I don't really, I don't really know. I don't, um, I think there's a general problem which arises whenever you, whenever you change the type of content that you're producing. Um, so anybody that is producing any sort of content, if they then change the style in a significant way, a lot of people are going to dislike that. Um, uh, and and so that's going to be part of it, right? So part of it is just that the videos that we do together are very different in style from any other video I've done. Now, um, I have changed the style of my videos before. There have been times before when I've done slightly different things. I mean, obviously, the, the, the YouTube started out um, as uh, a, a, it just lecture. It, they were just introductory PowerPoint lectures. But then I gradually, you know, started doing a few other things. I did, you know, discussions with people. I, I did some videos where it was just me talking to a camera like this. And actually, each of those times, there has been a negative response, at least from some people. So, you know, it's always the case when you, when you, when you bring out like a different type of content, some people aren't going to like it. Um, now, I don't think that really accounts for the, the degree of dislike that you have received. Um, so... I, I mean, I think that you are, you, you, you come across perhaps as um, maybe a bit mean-spirited. Uh, like it's, uh, you, uh, you know, I mean, you, you, you don't um, have much of a filter, let's put it that way, right? And like when you're talking about, um, you know, the sorts of arguments that other people have given, uh, you... You know, you'll just say like, okay, this stuff is, yeah, you, you just talk, you're not very nice, right? Like, so there's there's not much in terms of a sort of, um, you don't exhibit any desire to like follow standard conversational conventions. Um, and, you know, uh, so some people aren't going to like that, especially because, of course, um, again, you know, this contrasts with the usual style of my videos because I'm so nice. I'm such a nice person and, and, and my niceness is really something that ma is manifest in almost all the videos I do. But then, you know, we make a video together and, and suddenly, I mean, you're not nice. And then your, your non-niceness probably brings out a, a certain, uh, you know, a certain degree of that in me as well. You know, I mean, like, I, do you know what I mean? Like there's so... So I imagine that when we are talking together, I'm perhaps a bit less nice than I am in all of my other videos. Um, and so maybe people don't like that either. Um, and then of course the other thing is, is that you are a, a radical skeptic. Um, and to some extent, I think you don't, well, I don't know, why am I saying to some extent? You don't really take philosophy um, as a sort of discipline that seriously, or at least when I say you don't take it seriously, um, I mean, clearly you're very capable of like working through philosophical arguments and stuff, but you just don't see it as being something that has uh, any chance of like getting at the truth or the facts. Um, so, you know, you have this, you know, r radical skepticism, which in itself is annoying to some people. Um, I mean, it used to be annoying to me. I've spoken, you know, before I I've made videos about how frustrating I used to find radical skepticism. Um, now, a lot, you know, a lot of other people are going to have that view. But then in addition, you know, not only are you a radical skeptic, but you're a radical skeptic who sort of 
it's just kind of telling philosophers to you know to go fuck themselves in a, in a lot of cases and um and and you just think that this whole idea of um you know forming beliefs on the basis of uh you know rationality and reason and uh intellectual reflection that uh, you know that that has no kind of worth right like that's not going to get you to reality um and so yeah it's a combination of um the fact that the type of content is different the fact that there's a certain kind of uh <laughs> there's a there's a mean streak to it and it's like it, it it sort of stands as something that is kind of really anathema to this tradition really that i'm working in and that i've built my audience on the basis of um i think that those are some reasons that might account for why uh, people dislike you. Um, <clears throat> okay, Jayan Amanda Kone. Thoughts on Alman's agreement theorem and related issues. I don't really, um, I don't know much about Alman's agreement theorem. Um, from what I've read, uh, it seems kind of trivial. So, you know, it, it's one of those things where it's like, given the conditions that are specified, um, so, like, if you have a specific definition of what rationality means, and then you have a specific set of priors, specific set of data, and so on, like, so you specify all of these very precise conditions, then, you know, two, like, two people who meet those conditions um, must come to the same posterior probabilities. But then that sort of just follows as, you know, like, again, like a kind of mathematical, it's, it's, it just follows mathematically. So it's, it's, it's trivial given this very precise set of conditions. That's, but again, I, I haven't read much about Alman's agreement theorem. Maybe there is something really important and substantive there. I mean, I can say more broadly, I, my understanding is this is something that is discussed in the context of Bayesianism. Um, I'm not a Bayesian, at least not in terms of like general epistemology. So I take Bayesianism to be very useful. I think it's an incredibly useful idealization in a lot of contexts. Um, there are contexts where we have background facts, or at least maybe maybe I should say there are contexts where we make background assumptions such that we are licensed in uh, affirming certain priors. So, uh, so you know, like the classic case of uh, the HIV test, right? I know the so I can fix the prior probability if I'm if I'm giving a HIV test to somebody. I can fix the prior probability that they have HIV based on the rate of HIV in whatever population I've taken them from. So I can just specify that they're from a given population. I can look at the rate of HIV in that population. I take that as my prior probability. So I have a prior probability that they have HIV. And then I'm going to know as well, like the prior probability of a positive result on the test, given that they have HIV. I'm going to know a prior probability of the, uh, I'm going to know the probability of the positive result, given that they don't have HIV. Um, and, and, and like, that's fine in that situation. Um, the sort of background assumptions I'm making license those priors. Now, in many cases, I think it, those sorts of background assumptions just aren't there. Um, and in some, like it wouldn't even sort of, so I think in some cases, you know, it just kind of wouldn't even make sense to sort of assi to assign probabilities to certain things. So like, if I'm thinking about um, like the confirmation that the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation gave to the Big Bang hypothesis. So from a Bayesian point of view, then I want to know the probability of the Big Bang hypothesis, given the observation of cosmic microwave background radiation. And in order to figure that out, I need to know the probability of the Big Bang hypothesis. I need to know the probability of the cosmic microwave background radiation Given the Big Bang, given that the Big Bang happened, I need to know the probability of the cosmic microwave background radiation. Given that the Big Bang didn't happen, from that I can figure out the probability of the cosmic microwave background radiation, etc. Now, I think that with respect to all of these points, there are significant problems um, assigning uh, probabilities. In, in particular, with something like so, if I say, okay, what's the probability of cosmic microwave background radiation given that the Big Bang did not happen? I, I mean, look. <laughs> I mean, obviously, right, like it's open to a Bayesian to just say, well, you know, you assign, you know, you just pull the priors from thin air, right? I mean, you can you can solve the problem that way. You can do that. But that's just, I, I, I mean, <laughs> like, yeah, so you you can do that. But I don't think that um, that's like 
in any way like uh, accurately tracking the way that pe the way that we think about these things or the sorts of um, uh, uh, so like what sort of degree of confidence do I have in this? So if I say what's the probability of cosmic microwave background radiation given that the Big Bang did not happen? I think what we should say to that is, well, I mean, it's just sort of undefined. Um, it just doesn't make sense to assign a probability there. Um, and so w what I want to say, I, I suppose, is to me, I think there are lots, of, there are plenty of situations where, you know, Bayesianism is really useful, um, but that uh, I don't endorse it as, as a sort of general epistemological framework. Um, now, that doesn't really directly answer anything about Alman's agreement theorem, but m maybe that gives you a sense of where I am with Bayesianism in general. Um, you, ask, you ask, how familiar are you with the rationalist movement, things such as less wrong, astral codex 10, overcoming bias, EA, etc.? Uh, not really that familiar. Um, I've, I've, I've encountered like bits and pieces from them, um, but uh, I've, n I mean, I, I'm not like part of that community. Um, I, I mean, with with uh, yeah with with less wrong um i think i read uh, what have i read from i've read a few bits and pieces on there i read something that they did about newcomb's problem i read um some stuff about bayesianism um they're into bayesianism aren't they um but yeah again like not not that much so um there's not really a lot i can say about that um uh jobin biju do you think the drowning child analogy provided by Peter Singer gives a convincing case for generous charitable giving? Well, I mean, I'm not really convinced by those sorts of arguments, um, but that's because I'm not really interested in, like, constructing moral theories. Um, you know, so, it, <clears throat> like, I, I, I would say, yeah, if I see a child drowning, I'm going to... I'm going to intervene if, if, if it's safe for me to do so. And um, I would also say that if somebody doesn't intervene, I'm probably going to think they're a prick. Um, but, like, I'm quite happy to just sort of draw... First of all, I'm quite happy to just draw an arbitrary line between, um, you, you know, like, people that are close to me and people that are far away. I'm not sure that it is so arbitrary, though, because when I'm, like, if I'm wandering along and I see somebody drowning, then... I think that immediately there's like a kind of personal connection um, that the, the, so to me, here's the thing. Right. And, you know, somebody like Peter Singer is <laughs> obviously going to find they're not going to agree with this. But like I, I when I see that happening, I just have this like in, like emotional response. I have this like, OK, I better I, I better do something. And this person is like right in front of me. And so now I feel like there's a personal connection there. And to me, that's enough. Right. Like that's that's enough to sort of make it the case that I'm going to think, yeah, you know, I ought to intervene. And when I say I ought to intervene, what that is going to cash out in is that I'm going to feel guilty if I don't intervene. I'm going to, you know, judge other people negatively if they didn't intervene in the same sort of situation, etc. Um, and more broadly, I can say that I want to live in a society where when you see other people in immediate need, you help them. Um, when like when you encounter it so i want to live in a world where when you encounter somebody who is in a sort of desperate situation their lives are in danger you help them out um whereas i'm not really so sure that uh i want to live in a world where um we sort of we we kind of sacrifice our wealth for the sake of like it for the sake of people who we have like no personal connection to at all i, I i'm not um, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure I really want to live in that world. So, um, uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, no, I mean, I'm not moved by it. But again, I mean, like, I'm a really hardcore anti-realist and I'm an anti-realist who's not really interested in building moral theories. Um, and I'm an anti-realist who's quite happy to just draw arbitrary lines and kind of go with whatever feels right. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, as it happens, I do think we should be doing much more to uh, help poorer countries when it comes to like um oh uh right it's my brother so um what was i saying um oh yeah the the uh the drown the drowning child analogy so i i think that the um i think that the 
I, I, I would see there as being number one relevant differences um, between, you know, like just observing a, a child drowning in front of you and then the fact that there's like people dying in other countries. I'm probably going to think there are relevant differences there. But then even if even if there weren't any relevant differences or there weren't differences that I would consider relevant, I'm I'm perfectly happy to just say, well, I like, look, I'm moved by the child. I'm not so moved by um, like these unspecified people in other countries. Now, as it happens, um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy with the idea that like we if it, so I suppose if we think about things like government interventions, so what should the institutions be doing? In that case, I'm like completely cosmopolitan and I don't really have any preference about whether we, um, it, you know, I, I, I don't say, oh, well, you know, like we ought to help people in this country rather than this country. If we're talking on, on the level of institutions, actually, I mean, I think, yeah, we should be doing much more to help people in poorer countries. But um, for me personally, I mean, like, no, I'm just going to act on the basis of like what I see around me and what moves me in the moment. Um, and so you also ask, if so, are you or are you an effective altruist? Um, absolutely not. I no, I don't. Um, I'm not particularly altruistic with my money. I when I get money, I don't like to give it away. And if I did give it away, I'd probably be giving it to things like I don't know, weird artists rather than um, you know people who are starving. So uh, that's what I would do with my money if I was in a position where I had enough that I felt I could be giving it away. Um, Josh Schultz, uh, what are your thoughts on moral error theory? So, so moral error theory, yeah. Um, well, the main question then is, uh, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm a moral anti-realist. Um, do I endorse error theory? Well, uh, not really. I mean, the question here is, is it the case that everyday moral judgments, like everyday moral thinking, makes a commitment to these problematic moral properties so um i don't know for instance categorical reasons right so if, if if i say something like you ought not to own slaves am i making a commitment to the idea that you, there is a categorical reason not to own slaves um i'm very skeptical of that at this point um and so i i, I think that um what i would say is is that if i'm talking to somebody who has explicitly told me that they do believe in, say, categorical reasons, and um, they take it that moral statements are expressing something about categorical reasons, well, then, I don't know, maybe I'd be an error theorist about that. Um, maybe, right? Um, but I, I, I don't endorse this as, like, a semantic theory. So I don't endorse the semantic theory about what everyday moral judgments are expressing. Um, but, I mean, there's another point here, which I think hasn't received so much attention from error theorists, but it's, I think it's a problem for the view. So, you know, I've done a lot of videos recently on approximate truth and, um, you know, the sort of impact that approximate truth has on, uh, on some, uh, on some other areas of philosophy, right? So if we start thinking of things in terms of, well, the most that we can do when we are, you know, modeling the world and theorizing about the world, the most we can hope for is approximate truth. Um, well, in that case, all of our judgments are going to be, strictly speaking, false. Um, I mean, approximate truth is just a kind of falsehood. Uh, any, any claim I make about the world... So if, if you think that, you know, the most that we get from science, the most that we get from our best theories of the world is just approximate truth, then, you know, you may well think that, look, pretty much any claim you make about the world is, strictly speaking, false. Um, so, <clears throat> OK, let's suppose then that that everyday moral thinking, everyday moral judgment does end up um, involving false presuppositions. Well, I think I could still judge that these judgments are sort of true enough. Um, so, so, I mean, maybe compare like uh, uh, colour judgments, right? I, I might say, for instance, the car is red. Um, now, what does it mean when I say the car is red? Well, Plausibly, I mean, you know, you might reject this, but there's a plausible argument that when you say the car is red, that's presupposing that redness is an intrinsic property of the surface of the car. Um, now, that is very controversial, right? 
Like, so you might think that there just are no intrinsic color properties. You might think that redness is something that, you know, maybe that's like a product of the mind or maybe it arises somehow in the like, it's like a secondary property. It arises in the relation between, um, you know, visual systems and objects. But I mean, it's not some intrinsic property of the surface of objects. Uh, I, I mean, I think that like, actually that's probably the standard view among color scientists and philosophers of color, right? Like there's not, I mean, there are some people who still defend it, but there's not many people these days who are defending like that sort of traditional color realism, right? Like there's not many people who think that colors are just intrinsic properties of surfaces of objects. Um, so, okay, granting all of that then, so let's say that um, when I say the car is red, it assumes that redness is an intrinsic property of the surface of the car, but there just are no intrinsic properties like that. Well, in that case, uh, the statement contains a false presupposition. Um, but I don't know. Does that mean that we're just going to say, oh, well, the statement is false and that's the end of it? I mean, not like, no, um, no. I mean, when I say the car is red, um, yeah, I mean, I think that given the sorts of standards that are operative in, you know, most everyday contexts, it's perfectly fine to just say, oh, yeah, that's true. Um, and and so I, I think I'd probably want to say the same sorts of sort of thing about moral judgments, right? Like I think even if I agreed with the semantic claim that the error theorist was making, and so so you know maybe I agree that moral judgments contain this false presupposition. I, I mean I, I guess yeah I mean technically it's going to entail that all moral judgments are false, but that's sort of trivial because they're going to be false in the same sense that like everything we say about the world is false. Um, and so, I mean, for this reason, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I would say I'm, although I'm very firmly on the anti-realist side, I'm not sure I would be on the error theorist side. <clears throat> uh, Julio C. Silva asks, uh, you said that you have read Chalmers' Reality Plus and it didn't convince you. What ar arguments didn't convince you and why? You know, I actually don't remember this. Um, I don't remember commenting that Chalmers... Uh, Chalmers' book didn't convince me. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure what I was referring to there, but I can say, like, look, Chalmers says a lot of things in that book. I mean, so I agree with some of the things, I disagree with other things. Um, but I take it that there's, broadly speaking, two things that Chalmers is driving at in that book. Um, like, the, the like, what's the main message of the book? Well, um, first of all, the, there's going to be some, uh, let's say, un like maybe not high probability, but there's like a significant probability that we could just be in a simulation. Um, so the, the simulation hypothesis is one that has to be taken seriously. And I think, does Chalmers say something like 25% is the number he, he puts in it? I mean, I don't think I could assign a number, but I basically, I, I agree with him. I don't think there's a good, um, you know, case uh, like against the simulation hypothesis. And I think, yeah, I mean, like maybe it's right. Um, it's That seems... That seems to me perfectly plausible. I, uh, so the, the the simulation argument um, is, I don't necessarily want to say convincing, but I think it's it sort of shifts my, I guess, my credence up enough that I would sort of take that quite seriously as a, uh, as a possibility. Um, okay, so I agree with him on that. And then the second thing he's saying is that um, it doesn't actually make any difference <laughs> if we're in a simulation. It doesn't matter, right? Even if this is just a simulation, it's it's perfectly like legitimate, um, you know. Th so this is just as you know, it's it, it has just as much a claim to being the real world as um, you know as what we always thought, it, it, as like the tr as on the traditional metaphysical picture. Um, and I agree with that as well. Uh, in fact, I'd probably go a bit further than Chalmers because like. You know, for me, I, I mean, I, I don't know, I mean, as long as you've got, like, as long as you've got sort of some, you know, regularities and, you know, you can kind of act and, and so on and, 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 you know, you can form expectations about the future and, um, you know, you have goals and you have means of acting on those goals. As long as you've got that in place, I, I'd probably just say, yep, that's a real world. I mean, I'm somebody who would absolutely get into Nozick's experience machine. No question. Um, and I would feel, as I'm getting into the experience machine, the way that I would think about it is not that I'm creating a fake reality, like a fake world, or not that I'm entering a dream world. I would just think that I'm, like, moving into a different world, but a perfectly real world, um, nevertheless. Well, I say perfectly real. Let's say it's 
just as real as whatever's going on here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so Log asks, Kane, are you planning to do any more discussions slash debates? I mean, maybe. I, well, I don't have anything planned in the immediate uh, future, but who knows what might happen in the longer term future. Majesty of Reason, favourite philosopher of science and why? Well, I mean, it has to be uh, Paul Feyerabend. Um, Feyerabend has long been my favourite philosopher of science. Um, I mean, I think the, the result, like, so when I first read Feyerabend's book, Against Method, it, it really, like, transformed the way that I was thinking about uh, science and philosophy of science. Um, I guess I, I used to be a sort of very traditional sort of materialist, uh, scientific realist sort of person. And um, reading Against Method... I kind of knew a little bit about Firebend before going into it, and I thought Firebend was like a joke, basically. You know, I just thought this guy is not—he's not somebody that you need to take that seriously, right? So I, I, I kind of went into it with a sort of dismissive attitude, and I think you know, after reading the first couple of chapters, it was like lightning. I mean, it just—it just blew up uh, my. So a lot of the sort of assumptions I've been making about like how science works and. Um, I guess just epistemology more broadly, like how we should form beliefs and all that. I mean, it it just tore it apart. I mean, um, so uh, and, and far, so first of all, Farabend had a big influence on me. Um, I, I I mean, I have many disagreements with Farabend, to be clear, uh, but I suppose that sort of broadly speaking, his um, you know his attack on like th this conception of rationality is involving. You know, rule following. Um, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm very much on board with that. I don't think there are any like, you know, universal rules of belief formation or belief revision. Um, or, uh, uh, and I, I think that um, what, what I love, I mean, the reason why Farabend is sort of he's he sort of occupies a space ab above other philosophers who may have said similar things is because he's actually just really entertaining. I mean, he's a really entertaining writer, and he's. He's kind of like somebody who's drawing on lots of different traditions. Um, like you can see, so I think in Against Method, you can sort of see the broadly analytic background. Um, but, you know, he's like, at that point anyway, you know, he's sort of starting to carve out a more personal style of doing philosophy. And um, there's a whole bunch of, and, and like, yeah, yeah, I mean, he's drawing on, on other traditions. He's... Uh, He's drawing on the arts, you know, like you can see that influence in his work. Um, and so I think that when I read Firebend, there's just like a whole load of really challenging arguments. Um, I think he's always really entertaining. Uh, he kind of tried to systematize ideas, like he took a kind of broad view of um, human intellectual development, let's say, and drew on lots of different traditions and, and you know I mean he came to conclude well, I mean even I would say uh, that he came to some conclusions that were were pretty uh, implausible but um, uh, yeah I mean I I, I love him um, and so uh, yeah I mean that's that's my favorite um, Marco Acuna what percentage of those books behind you have you read hmm. uh, Maze Plan on doing any dedicated videos on the philosophy of time and antinatalism? Um, no. Uh, <laughs> not, not, not in... Uh, I mean, I don't have any plan for that. Who knows? Maybe I will in the future. Um, with respect to, um, to time, uh, I can say very briefly, I'm, I, well, I'm a constructivist, uh, as I am with everything else <laughs> these days. Um, so, uh, you know, I, th that's my, well, yeah, <laughs> that's my view of, of time. Um, with respect to antinatalism, I, I just don't see how it would, be, like, I, I don't see how it would benefit me. I'm not really convinced that um, there's anything morally wrong with people having kids. Um, and I suppose the way I look at it is um, I just don't, I, I, I mean, I don't know. It seems like if, everybody did sign up for antinatalism that might have negative consequences for me because by the time I get to be like you know 90 if I get that old I'm going to kind of require I'm going to rely on there being you know a robust sort of welfare state and so on in order to take care of me because I'll be you know old and, in, and and disabled presumably by that age um, and I take it that you want people having kids so that you've got like 
I, I don't know. I worry that if ev so, if everybody stopped having kids, it seems like like that might destabilize society in some way. Um, I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't, but uh, that would be a worry. And then once I get to be old, um, you know, I'd be kind of fucked. So um, for that reason, I, I'm afraid I can't really go in for antinatalism. But once I'm dead, once I'm gone, uh, if you want to, if you guys want to stop having kids, I mean, yeah, go for it. Um, that's that's fine. <laughs> like, um, okay. I can, uh, as I'm answering these questions, I can like smell like a burning plastic sort of smell. It's a bit worrying. My brother was doing some cooking a minute ago, and I need to go and check something. Okay, so uh, I may be back. Hopefully, I'll be back in a minute. <laughs>